right. Mike is talking about it's better evangelism to talk about everlasting life. He and I walk most Saturdays. We walk six, seven, eight, nine, ten miles. And this is one of the things we talk about a lot. And uh, so uh, Mike's done a lot of work preparing for this. And uh, I've heard the message. It's excellent. So let's welcome him up. Right. Looks like a bummer. I missed out on being a perfect man by about two or three inches. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. The title of my talk today is um, "It's Better Evangelism to Talk About Everlasting Life." And in evangelism today, we hear a wide diversity of terms used to express what one is to believe in Jesus for. We may hear "saved," "salvation," or "savior" without further explanation child of God, born again, heaven, forgiveness of sins, justification, gift of the Holy Spirit, relationship with God, the finished work of Christ, sins paid in full, or even Jesus in one's heart. But to evaluate what terms are appropriate, we need to start with what is the bullseye or core of the saving message. As Dix Winston demonstrated from the Gospel of John at the GS National Conference in May, there are three essential elements to the saving message. Number one, believe. Number two, in Jesus. Number three, for everlasting life. Let's quickly examine elements number one and two. First, believe. Believe or faith is being convinced or persuaded that a proposition is true. One cannot be convinced or persuaded about something that one does not understand. One can only believe concepts one understands. You know, for example, one cannot believe that the sky is blue if he doesn't know that what the sky is or doesn't know what the color blue is. Mm -hmm. Likewise, a person must understand all three essentials of the saving message in order to believe them. Understanding is a precursor to belief. However, if one understands or misunderstands believe to mean a decision without the persuasion or surrendering control of one's life or turning away from sins, then although he may still call it belief or faith, he is not believing in Jesus in the biblical sense. He may still use the correct term, believe or faith, but with these other meanings, he does not have the biblical meaning or God's meaning of believe or faith. Likewise, one needs to understand that the Jesus in element number two is Jesus of the New Testament. If one is believing in some other person named Jesus, other than Jesus of the New Testament, then again, that person is not believing in Jesus for everlasting life in the biblical sense. Our focus today is going to be on the third essential element, everlasting life. I'm going to ask the question, what is the core understanding of everlasting life when believing in Jesus for everlasting life? The core understanding of everlasting life must be able to answer the question, what happens when I die? If a person is unable to answer this question or answers incorrectly, then that person is not believing in Jesus for everlasting life. My main point is that the core understanding of everlasting life is that upon death, one's eternal destiny is with Jesus and his people in a wonderful place forever. There are two key essential elements of everlasting life, life and everlasting. These two key elements are readily apparent in the term everlasting life. It is called life. So upon death, one is in a wonderful place with Jesus and his people. To have life is more than having mere existence. Life means something far better than just existing in the lake of fire. Life is a positive experience, not just a neutral or negative experience. Life is qualified by everlasting, so one's eternal destiny upon death is forever, guaranteed, irrevocable, can never be lost, and is eternally secure. Without either of these two elements, you don't have everlasting life, and everlasting life has the wrong name. Now one may ask, why do I say everlasting life is the core concept that needs to be understood and believed instead of forgiveness, justification, an unspecified salvation, or any of the other terms associated with believing in Jesus that I've previously mentioned? To answer this, our evangelistic terms and concepts need to be guided by the book of the Bible that was written for evangelism, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was written for the purpose to lead unbelievers to believe in Jesus for everlasting life. Recall John 20, 30, and 31. 
And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The word believe is used over 90 times in the Gospel of John, which is why many call the Gospel of John the Gospel of belief. Life, everlasting life, and living forever are also repeatedly mentioned in the Gospel of John over 40 times, which is why the Gospel of John can also be called the Gospel of everlasting life. Here are a sample of verses from the Gospel of John which mention everlasting life. John 3, 15 and 16, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 36, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 4:14, 4, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. John 6, 40. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. John 6, 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. John 6, 58, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. And John 10, 28, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. In these verses, there is the everlasting aspect of everlasting life. We have never perishing, never thirsting, never hungering and living forever. We also have the life aspect as well, as life is contrasted with death and perish, and the believer is living, not perishing, dead, or dying. Let's look at the purpose statement again to have further confirmation on why the core concept of everlasting life must answer the question, what happens when I die? Recall that the purpose statement of the Gospel of John is to call people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The meaning of the Christ, the Son of God, is defined in John 11, 25 through 27. This is a pivotal point in the Gospel of John, as Jesus is speaking to Martha in the context of her brother Lazarus having died a few days ago. Lazarus' death is obviously at the forefront of Martha's mind. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha replies to Jesus, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus' words are a comfort to Martha in light of her brother's death. Jesus promises that the one who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, shall live again when one dies and that person in another sense will never die. To believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is to believe that Jesus gives everlasting life to those who believe in him for everlasting life. Jesus' conversation with Martha in light of her brother Lazarus' death gives us the bullseye or core concept of everlasting life. The core concept is that death is not the end for the believer in Jesus Christ, and everlasting life answers the question of what happens when I die. After death, the believer will live again in a wonderful place with Jesus and his people forever. Everyone will exist forever, but not everyone's eternal existence may be called life. One can exist eternally in the lake of fire, but that is not life or living according to the Bible. An eternally secure life with Jesus forever is what is promised, and that is what is biblically called everlasting life. Now that we have the core concept of everlasting life, let's now turn our attention to other terms that are used in evangelism and examine whether these terms adequately convey the meaning of everlasting life. We'll first examine terms that when properly understood do convey the core concept of everlasting life. Saved, salvation, savior, child of God, born again in heaven. Saved or salvation are probably the most popular terms used in place of everlasting life in evangelism. This may be because of the count of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, where the apostle Paul declared, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved 
through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, the New Testament doesn't always use saved or salvation to refer to eternal salvation, but these famous passages do. In addition, John 3, 16 to 17 equates everlasting life with being saved. In John 3, 16, the term used is everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In John 3, 17, the parallel equivalent to everlasting life is saved. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In these passages, saved, when properly understood, is equivalent to everlasting life. That is, believing in Jesus to save you eternally from the bad place, so you will be with him forever in a wonderful place. However, there are those that will argue that being saved or salvation does not need to include the concept of eternal security, and the Philippian jailer may have understood being saved in a temporal, conditional, or unspecified way. Zane Hodges has a great message available on the GS YouTube channel called Saved or in a State of Grace that shows biblically why this can't be true. In addition, I want to point out that the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 must have been contemplating his own death and what happens after. Because when he asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved, this was moments after he was about to kill himself since he, since he thought the prisoners under his watch had escaped. After being told by Paul and Silas to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, we are told a few verses later in Acts 16.34 that the Philippian jailer rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. Now no one rejoices regarding a victory unless he believes such victory is guaranteed and for sure. There is no reason to rejoice if one is unsure of their eternal destiny. There is no reason for the Philippian jailer to rejoice unless he was sure that his eternal destiny after death is with Jesus forever. There are others who will say that one just needs to believe in Jesus for salvation in some unspecified sense or leave it up to the interpretation of the hearer. However, unless the hearer understands salvation or saved to mean everlasting life, then he is still not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved in the way that Paul and Silas meant for the Philippian jailer or Jesus meant for Nicodemus. Saved and salvation are biblical equivalents to everlasting life, but one still needs to explain the biblical concept of everlasting life. Saved or salvation cannot mean whatever a person wants it to mean. Jesus doesn't save one eternally if one is believing Jesus for a salvation that can be lost or a salvation from sickness, poverty, or physical danger. For an excellent treatment of the word saved, I suggest you look at Bob Wilkins' book, 10 Most Misunderstood Words, uh, which aren't available here at this conference, but it's available <laughs> online. <laughs> Similar to salvation and saved is the term savior. When properly understood, the term savior is an equivalent to, of everlasting life for evangelism. Jesus is the savior who provides an eternally secure and guaranteed salvation of everlasting life to all who believe in him. Biblically, this can be seen in the response of the Samaritans in John 4, 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This is the only place in the Gospel of John where the term Savior occurs. Here, Savior is equated with the Christ. So biblically, to believe that Jesus is the Savior is to believe that Jesus is the Christ the one who guarantees everlasting life to all who believe in him for everlasting life, as we've seen earlier in John 11:25 to 27. Unfortunately, savior is not always used in the biblical sense. Many will say one needs to believe in Jesus as savior from their sins. However, if a person believes that Jesus is his savior from his sins, but still doesn't know that after he dies that his eternal destiny is with Jesus in a wonderful place forever, then that person is not properly believing in Jesus as savior. Let's tell people that Jesus is the Savior, the Savior who provides a secure salvation in a wonderful place with, with Jesus forever, for all who believe in him for such salvation. Sometimes you'll hear the saving message as believing in Jesus to be born again, or believing in Jesus to become God's child. Now, these are equivalent if you understand biblically from the Gospel of John what being born again means, or what being God's child means. To become a child of God, one needs to believe in Jesus to be born again. Again, see John 1, 12, 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born, 
not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To become a child of God requires one to be born again, or to be born of God. And Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3.3 3, that, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To become a child of God and for Nicodemus to see the kingdom requires Nicodemus to be born again and to be born of God. John 3.16 provides Jesus' answer to Nicodemus on how to become a child of God and how to be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So biblically, to believe in Jesus to be born again as God's child means to believe in Jesus to be born again as God's child with everlasting life. Being born again as God's child is equivalent to everlasting life when properly understood. When we share the good news of being born again as a child of God, don't forget to mention everlasting life. That is spending eternity after death with Jesus forever in his kingdom. We can use these terms, but we need to communicate the concept of everlasting life. Heaven is also a very popular term to explain what we are believing in Jesus for, a trip to heaven. Now, based on the media, TV, and movies, heaven is understood as the desired place to go after death. I don't think it is problematic to use heaven to communicate the life part in everlasting life, as heaven is understood as a wonderful place people go after death. But when using the term heaven, one must also communicate the everlasting part of everlasting life. A person needs to understand that their destiny with Jesus in heaven is guaranteed, irrevocable, and eternally secure. The fundamental concept of everlasting life needs to be understood. A person can't believe in Jesus to take them to heaven, but believe that they are only safe for now, or if they fail to persevere in good works, that they will lose their trip to heaven, or if they fail to persevere in works, prove that heaven wasn't their eternal destiny in the first place. Of course, Jesus never explained eternal life as being in heaven, and believers' eternal destinies are ultimately on the new earth and not in heaven. But this is a discipleship truth. Heaven can be a valid way to communicate that a believer will be, Jesus, be with Jesus in a wonderful place as long as the person understands that this being with Jesus is eternally secure and everlasting. Now we turn to additional blessings that are received when we believe in Jesus for everlasting life. But these blessings are not equivalents of everlasting life, even when properly understood. While these other blessings may be beneficial to mention in evangelism, we still need to communicate the meaning of everlasting life. What does it mean that one's sins have been forgiven? Forgiveness of sins that means that sins are no longer a barrier in one's relationship with God. One is in fellowship with God. There are two views on forgiveness. The common view is that there are two kinds of forgiveness a positional, once and for all forgiveness, and an ongoing, experiential, fellowship forgiveness. The second view is that all references to forgiveness in the Bible are an ongoing fellowship, experiential forgiveness. Regardless of which of these two views one holds, we need to ask the question whether forgiveness of sins is equivalent to everlasting life. To answer this question, we should ask whether someone can believe that Jesus has forgiven their sins, there is no barrier in their relationship with God, but yet at the same time be unsure what will happen when they die. Yes, this is possible, since forgiveness of sins and everlasting life are different blessings. Only if, if a person believes in Jesus for everlasting life at the same time as believing in Jesus for forgiveness of sins, will that person receive everlasting life when believing in Jesus for forgiveness of sins. If you evangelize with forgiveness of sins, you still need to explain that one needs to believe in Jesus for everlasting life. It is quite telling that the Gospel of John never presents the saving message as believe in Jesus for forgiveness of sins. Only one verse in the Gospel of John speaks of forgiveness, John 20, 23. But this verse is about believers forgiving sins of other human beings. The context of John 20, 23 is not about receiving eternal life. Ken Yates gave a wonderful talk on this at the GS National Conference, and I invite you to visit the GS YouTube channel to view it. To sum up, one can believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins without understanding and believing in Jesus for everlasting life. Since forgiveness of sins, having a right relationship with God, is not the same as everlasting life, we should evangelize with the concept of everlasting life instead of the forgiveness of sins. Justification. Yes, justification is by faith in Jesus, but is it by believing in Jesus for justification or by believing in Jesus for everlasting life? 
To answer this question, we need to answer first, what is justification? Justification is the judicial declaration by God the Father that one is righteous. Now, can someone understand and believe that they are justified, declared righteous by God, and yet be unsure where they will spend eternity when they die? Yes, because justification and everlasting life are different blessings. One can believe in Jesus for the biblical concept of justification, and yet at the same time not believe in Jesus for everlasting life. The Gospel of John never uses the term justified to describe the gift that Jesus offers. Justification is never offered as the gift to believe in Jesus for. Further, it is God the Father who justifies. See Romans 8, 33 through 34. Jesus Christ is never presented as the member of the Trinity who justifies a believer. Jesus is the giver of everlasting life. See John 10, 28. But justification comes from God the Father. This again shows that justification is a different blessing from everlasting life. Yes, everyone is justified forever at the moment one believes in Jesus for everlasting life. But justification is a result of believing in Jesus for everlasting life. If one thinks that they are justified, declare righteous by believing in Jesus, but still doesn't know where they will spend eternity when they die, then that person still hasn't biblically believed in Jesus for everlasting life. When someone believes in Jesus for everlasting life, they are at the same moment justified, whether they know they are justified or not. However, the converse is not true. When someone believes in Jesus for justification without believing in Jesus for everlasting life, such a person is neither justified nor has everlasting life. His assurance of justification is a false assurance. Passages in Romans and Galatians which speak of justification by faith should be understood that one is justified when he believes in Jesus for everlasting life. Justification is not an equivalent of life. Romans, Galatians, and the other books of the Bible that use the term justified are written to believers who have already believed in Jesus for everlasting life. The Gospel of John written for evangelism does not use the term justified. Jesus never evangelized with the term justified. Justification is a doctrine that is taught in the books of the New Testament written for disciples who already understand and believed in Jesus for everlasting life. The Bible teaches justification as a discipleship truth for believers, not an evangelistic truth for unbelievers. The treatment of the gift of the Holy Spirit is presented in the New Testament similarly to justification. We don't believe in Jesus for the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is a result that occurs simultaneously today when we believe in Jesus for everlasting life. See Acts 10, 24, 10 45. The gift of the Holy Spirit means the blessing of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the blessing that all believers, Jews and Gentiles, have been placed into one body, the church. Because of the gift of the Holy Spirit is different from everlasting life, someone can believe in Jesus for the gift of the Holy Spirit, but yet not know where they will spend eternity when they die. Those who are believing in Jesus in the biblical sense know for sure they have everlasting life, but they may not know for sure that they have the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that everlasting life is a different blessing from the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of John, everlasting life is a present possession of those who have believed in Jesus. But yet in John 7:39, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. In Acts 2:38, the gift of the Holy Spirit was not given to believing first century Jews living in Israel at the time of Jesus' crucifixion until they had first repented and were baptized. However, these first century Jews received everlasting life at the moment they believed that Jesus is the Christ. But the gift of the Holy Spirit was given later when they had repented and were baptized. The blessing of the gift of the Holy Spirit is presented in scripture as a discipleship truth, but never as an essential part of the saving message that one must understand and believe. How does one receive the gift of the Holy Spirit today? By believing in Jesus for everlasting life. I have often heard the gospel expressed as put your faith in Jesus so that you can have a relationship with God. It is true that a believer has a relationship with God that can never be broken, but isn't a relationship with God a different concept from everlasting life? Can't one believe that they have a relationship with God, even a relationship that cannot be lost, but yet fail to believe that they will be with Jesus forever after they die? Again, Jesus did not evangelize in this way. So although it's great to tell a believer that they have a permanent relationship with God, a person needs to believe in Jesus for everlasting life, not just some unspecified relationship with God. Now we look at blessings that are not dependent on believing in Jesus for everlasting life. The finished work of Christ, to pay for all your sins, or Jesus in one's heart. 
I have frequently heard the saving message articulated as believe in the finished work of Christ. If one means that we are to believe in Jesus' finished work on the cross so that we receive everlasting life when we believe in him for everlasting life, then I don't have an issue as everlasting life is included and ultimately one is called to believe in Jesus for everlasting life. However, unfortunately, most of the time when the call is made to believe in Jesus' finished work on the cross, the presenter means to believe that Jesus' death on the cross paid for all your sins. What is stated is that if you don't believe in Jesus' finished work, then your sins have not been paid for. Having your sins paid for is not an equivalent to everlasting life. Someone can believe that Jesus' finished work on the cross has paid for all their sins, but still be unsure of one's eternal destiny. Belief in the payment for all of one's sins doesn't necessarily translate to a belief that one is going to spend eternity with Jesus forever. There are also other problems with conditioning payment of one's sins with believing in Jesus. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world, not just the elect or believing world, John 1.29. Likewise, Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2, 2. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world, not just the sins of those who believe in him. It is simply unbiblical to tell someone that you need to believe in Jesus to have your sins paid for. People whose sins have already been paid for in full by Jesus do not have a sin problem. They have a life problem. People are sent to the lake of fire not because their sins are unpaid, but because they are missing everlasting life so that their names are not written in the book of life. See Revelation 20:15. If Jesus' work on the cross only finished paying for the sins of those who believe in him, then you have the unbiblical Calvinist doctrine of limited atonement. What the Bible teaches is that Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world so that everyone is savable. No one needs their sins to be paid for. Jesus already did that. People need everlasting life. They receive everlasting life by believing in Jesus for everlasting life. Conditioning payment on sins on believing in Jesus' finished work is unbiblical and does not communicate the core concept of everlasting life. Having Jesus in one's heart is based on a misunderstanding of Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Nowhere in this passage does it mention Jesus being in one's heart. It is unclear what is figuratively meant by those who say to believe in Jesus to have him come into your heart. But couldn't someone believe that Jesus has come into their heart but still be unsure of their eternal destiny when they die? The concept of Jesus in one's heart is different from the concept of everlasting life. Revelation 3.20 is not even connected to faith in Jesus for everlasting life, but instead speaks of an invitation for fellowship between a believer and Jesus. Ultimately, the expression of Jesus in one's heart creates confusion and doesn't explain the concept of everlasting life, so it should be avoided in evangelism. Everlasting life is what Jesus told people to believe in him for. To believe in Jesus for everlasting life requires one to understand where they will be after they die, that is, in a wonderful place with Jesus and his people forever. Saved, Savior, child of God, born again in heaven, may be appropriate terms if properly understood as conveying the core concept of everlasting life. Other blessings like forgiveness, justification, the gift of the Holy Spirit, or having a relationship with God are blessings received at the same moment one believes in Jesus for everlasting life. But while we might mention or describe these additional blessings when evangelizing, we must tell others that everlasting life is what to believe in Jesus for. Terms such as the finished work of Jesus for the payment of your sins, Jesus in one's heart, Jesus saving you in some unspecified or temporal way, or Jesus as a probationary or unspecified savior are not biblical expressions. And these are not benefits that the Bible promises when believing in Jesus for everlasting life. These expressions should be avoided as they neither convey the concept of everlasting life and are not blessings that are given when a person believes in Jesus for everlasting life. Everlasting life is the term that our Lord Jesus used when explaining the gift he offers to those who believe in him. Let's not forget to communicate that we are to believe in Jesus to be with him after we die in a wonderful place forever. We would do well to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, thank you for listening, and I think we still have time for questions, or? Oh, okay. Didn't run out the clock. How about discussing the difference between someone who says, I believe Jesus can give me eternal life, 
versus I believe Jesus has given me eternal life. Yeah. What's the difference? Well, I, I mean, that's the, I, I guess this all, the can, the can doesn't imply assurance, right? I, obviously, everybody in Christendom believes Jesus can give everlasting life, right. right? If you believe that he's God, that he can give you, you know, the, the difference is, do you believe that he's given you everlasting life? Because that's what he's promised, that everyone who believes in him for everlasting life has everlasting life. So the only way you are believing that is if you know for sure that you have everlasting life. If you don't know for sure, then you're not believing what he's promised. You're not believing what Jesus told Martha there in 11, 25 to 27. You know, that, that, that's not to say that you've never believed it, because if you've ever believed it, you're eternally secure forever. But for your own assurance of that, that depends on you believing what Jesus told Martha right, right now, currently, yeah. What?